people at tables, over food, over conversation, and over an invitation into discipleship. Um, Lent is the season of 40 days leading to Easter, and we have looked at stories of Jesus at the table with people like Levi, with the 5,000, with Mary and Martha, with the Pharisees, with Zacchaeus, and this morning we close at the temple. So, would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, throughout this series at the table, we've looked at tables. Uh, who was invited to the table? Who was welcomed at the table? Uh, and thought about what lessons we may have learned at the table. When you think about your own experiences at the table, what lessons did you learn? Maybe it was how to eat your food. Um, I know one of the lessons I learned was don't talk with food in your mouth. Um, I often taught that to everybody too. Um, or there are other ways, maybe you learned um, what food you liked or maybe even what food you didn't like. Maybe you learned um, foods of your culture uh, from your family traditions. Maybe you learned how to sit at the table or how you were excused from the table. The stories that you learned at the table told you about who you are. Of course, it wasn't the only place that we learned who we are, but we learned who we are at the table. Len Sweet, who's a United Methodist pastor and author, in his book, From Tablet to Table, he said, if we were to make the table the most sacred object of furniture in every home, in every church, in every community, our faith would quickly regain its power. Our world would quickly become a better place. The table is the place where identity is born, the place where the story of our lives is retold, reminded, and relived. And so here we are on Palm Sunday at the beginning of Holy Week. It starts with Jesus and shouts of Hosanna, and by the end of the week, the shouts are different. They're shouts of crucify him. Now this is really a familiar story. We hear it every year, over and over again. For the most part, the details of the story really don't change. So some of these things in the story may sound familiar, because they are. But I think one thing to remember about Jesus is that Jesus wasn't a Christian. Jesus was a Jewish man, which means that he participated in the festivals and the holidays of the Jewish traditions. And around this time, in the city of Jerusalem, there would have been a festival of Jewish tradition celebrating and remembering the Passover of Moses. The story remembers the 12 plagues where Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said no. So there are 12 plagues that happened, the last of which being the death of the firstborn child. The angel of death would pass over homes painted with the lamb's blood. And as a result of this final plague, Pharaoh let the Hebrew people go. And Passover retells the story every year. So this is a high holy day for the temple. People would come and make sacrifices and pilgrimages to the temple. Which means, during this time, when Jesus was entering Jerusalem, Jerusalem was full of people. There were people everywhere. And Jew Jerusalem was also under Roman rule, much like most of the known world at that time, or at least that they knew. Rome achieved rule by, by violence and by war. They would go into an area and say, this is now ours. Um, and if you disagreed, they would kill you. Um, and then they would say, we bring you peace. Um, you know peaceful things. Um, and then often, the way, that they, um, the way that they emphasized how much peace that they were going to bring is they would uh, use this method of um, death penalty or torture called crucifixion, which is nailing one to a cross. And so they would not only nail one to the cross, um, but they would line the streets with these crosses with people on them um, reminding everyone who was actually in charge. 
And so this would threaten anyone who would think about even standing up to them or, or offering any kind of contradiction or challenge. And you learn really quickly what you need to say and do in order to keep your life. Now Pilate was the governor of Jerusalem at this time and was charged with making sure that the Jewish people in Jerusalem were kept in line. Now for the most part in the Roman Empire, religion was really fine. They were accepting of many religions and religious practices. The only thing that they really had a problem with is you couldn't question the empire or threaten the empire. But however you practiced your religion outside of that was just fine. So, all of this backdrop of the story brings us into Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in this parade. Now, the story goes that Jesus rode on a donkey through the streets of Jerusalem. People laid down their coats and waved palm branches, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! It's a nice little parade, and who doesn't like a parade? So this parade is happening through the streets, and there's really a lot that's happening in this story. There's also another parade that's happening on the other side of town. On one side, Jesus was entering, and on the other side of town, Pilate was entering. Jesus entered riding on a donkey, which is an animal of peace. The prophet Zechariah, the king entering, uh, the king entering Jerusalem on a donkey, was to banish the weapons of war from the land and speak peace to the nations. The kingdom that Jesus usher, it ushers in is not one of violence and war, but peace, or in Hebrew, shalom. In contrast, on the other side of town, Pilate rode in on a stallion or on a horse, and he was in full military regalia because Rome's kingdom is actually not one of peace, but one of violence and one of conquering. So there's these two different parades happening on each side of town. And there's something about Jesus's entry that's a little prearranged because he says, go into the village and get the donkey. Um, they know where it's going to be. They have a plan. And so in many ways, what Jesus is doing is actually a prearranged political protest. Jesus is very aware of what he's doing, and Jesus is very aware of the message that he's sending. It's also not an accident. And it's really not anything contrary to what Jesus has been saying or doing throughout his entire ministry. And as Jesus passes through, people cry, Hosanna. Hosanna is a word that means save me or save us. It means help. Now that might change the scene a little bit as the palms are being waved and being laid down. At the same time, the word has been used so much and some of the definition has shifted. It means a little bit of a cry of celebration and also help. I mean, if you think about it just in some of the slang terms, um, if you think about the way the word bad has been used differently, like that's so bad, I mean, that's negative, right? But what about, oh, you're so bad. It's a little maybe teasingly. Um, or um, at one point, you know, that's bad. Like that meant that it was good, right? You know that time, right? Um, each one has a little different meaning depending on the time or even depending on the person who's using it. So the truth is in the crowd that day, some people were shouting Hosanna and meaning save me or help me. And some people were crying, Hosanna, yay, you're here. And some people were crying, Hosanna, yes, you are saved. So this parade was a little chaotic. That's a little bit of chaos in the middle of everything. And then it continues as Jesus goes to the temple. And it's common for people to be outside of the temple selling animals or products for sacrifice because when you're traveling long distances, it's easier. It's easier to have those things available rather than bring them with you. And Jesus wasn't upset about that, but Jesus was upset about something else that was going on. Growing up in about 4 BC, in the town next to Galilee, which is Jesus' hometown, 
the town next to Galilee staged a revolt against Rome. In response, the Roman Empire came in with force and leveled the town. Every citizen of that town was put into slavery. Now this wasn't a secret, this was something everybody knew about, because Rome rarely kept these things secret to remind others what would happen if they stepped out of line. So Joseph, who was Jesus' father, was a carpenter, and likely would have been hired and helped to rebuild or to repair the city. So the story about this town would have been one that Jesus knew very well, both in what happens when you question Rome, and also um, what it means to rebuild. So this is part of Jesus' story. And he comes to the temple, the temple which is supposed to be a, a sanctuary from violence and cruelty. The sanctuary, the temple, was supposed to be a place separate from the Roman Empire, a place of prayer, it's sanctuary. And many times, the temple was also supposed to be a challenge to the empire. I mean, think about the prophet Nathan who challenged King David after his relationship with Bathsheba. The temple doesn't belong to the Roman Empire or to the empire at all. And the empire has no role in the temple. But these money changers on the outside of the temple weren't just selling items for the temple. They were also collecting additional taxes for the empire. They were taking care of it. They were taking advantage of the poor of their own people, ripping them off and letting the empire into the temple, making the temple an unsafe place, not a place of peace and prayer, not a place of challenge, but Jesus calls it a den of robbers. And the rest of the story, Jesus, um, Jesus is pretty angry, which isn't a picture about Jesus that we tell all that often. The flipping tables, Jesus, Often we like the story of happy Jesus, the peaceful Jesus. And I'm going to be honest, I like that Jesus a whole lot better too. But this Jesus, this righteously angry Jesus, sometimes we need this Jesus. Sometimes we need someone who will remind us when we've messed up, when we've gone past the boundaries and need some correction. Sometimes we need that Jesus. Jesus' life and ministry was often challenging power structures. Why are the poor being taken advantage of? Why are we making life harder on them rather than helping them? Why are the sick being marginalized and excluded rather than being helped into healing? Why is violence and war the message we cling to when God's message is one of nonviolence and peace? You start asking these questions like Jesus did, you start acting in rebellion, and you're met with anger and a desire to maintain the status quo, and sometimes, like Jesus, even death. Now, I always say, uh, when reading the stories of Scripture, it's such a shame that they don't have anything to do with today, right? It's so sad. I mean, we have no political tensions anywhere, right? We have no religious tensions anywhere. <laughs> We're all just doing so great, right? 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 <laughs> uh, don't they speak into our lives here today? I mean, there are some Christians who will say, look around the world and they'll say that this proves the end is coming, the end of the world is near. And the truth is these tensions have existed forever. We see homelessness, poverty, war, people taken advantage of, and we want it fixed. We want a parade where someone comes in to fix it all, fix it, Jesus. And Jesus enters riding on a donkey to shouts of Hosanna. In the midst of this all, Jesus surprises us with a colt while we were expecting a stallion. Jesus surprises us with a different kind of radical, peaceful, Entering in as a protest to everything happening then in Jerusalem and the Roman Empire, everything that's happening here and now. Hosanna. And I think sometimes we confuse Hosanna for hallelujah. Hallelujah is a cry of praise. But that's not really what Hosanna means. Save me. Help me. Dear Messiah. 
Hosanna, save me. Dear Jesus, Hosanna, help us. Help us, save us. I mean, have you ever cried those cries at all? Help me, save me, Hosanna. And while we're waiting for a hallelujah, hallelujah means praise the Lord. We're waiting for the praise to come. In the meantime, Hosanna, help us, save us. And the help that Jesus offers isn't always what's expected. Jesus wasn't always what was expected of a Messiah. Jesus was born as a vulnerable infant. Jesus challenges everything that was believed about the Messiah. Jesus comes in peacefully. Jesus saves us, not always in the ways that we expect, and sometimes not even in the ways that we want. Hosanna, save us, help us. And Jesus also offers an invitation and the help. How will you join me? How will we help each other? The church is the body of Christ at work in the world. Hosanna, help us. The church should be able to say, here we are. Now the attitude of this week, this holy week, shifts throughout the week. It starts chaotic in this parade and it moves into a different kind of chaos. It's a wilderness that has hope baked in it. I mean, that's the truth of most wildernesses. You keep going through the wilderness because of what's on the other side. And the wilderness looks different different to each of us. Just as some are crying, save me, and some are crying, yay. Some are being taken advantage of at the temple. Some aren't even able to make it to the temple. Some are sitting at tables. Some are flipping tables. We're all in the same storm, but we aren't all in the same boat. Len Sweet again says in his book, From Tablet to Table, to come to the table is to learn about our real selves, not some construct conceived by someone else, but who God made us to be. May we come to the table this week to be told who we are a beloved child of God. During Holy Week, this stormy wilderness gets worse before it gets better. Jesus starts together with crowds of people and ends on his own in the cross. He cries on the cross asking if God has abandoned him. And that's also not where the story ends. Don't make the middle of Jesus' story the end. Don't make the middle of your story the end. This week is one that's full of drama and surprises. The cries of the crowd move from Hosanna to crucify him. As you experience the rest of the story this week, may we reflect on that peaceful ruler who calls us to be peacemakers. May we find the way that Jesus' story still speaks into our own. May we live the way that Jesus taught us in love, mercy, grace, and peace. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, help us, save us. And may we remember that help isn't just on the way. Help is already here. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen.